All right, we are still talking about instrumental variables in the effect. Uh, so I talked in the last video about the validity assumption uh, in instrumental variables. The validity assumption is the assumption that says that we can assume that our instrumental variable has no back doors between it and the outcome variable, or at least that we can close all the back doors. It is a source of random variation, at least once we've controlled for a couple of things. Because uh, that's what we want to do, right? We want to treat our instrumental variable as a source of random variation in our treatment. That's what we are looking for. We're looking for a source of exogenous variation in treatment. Treatment might not always be randomly assigned, but if it's randomly assigned at least some of the time, we can isolate that some of the time and use just that. Just like in a randomized controlled trial uh, where you know you don't use all the data, you just use the part of the data that you have actually done some randomization in. We're looking in just part of the data where there happens to be a very good view on the causal effect. So for this to be true, we do need that validity assumption to hold. We do need it to be the case that the instrumental variable is unrelated to the outcome except through the treatment. It was actually an even stronger condition than just saying that there are no back doors. This is saying in effect that we expect the causal diagram to look sort of like this. In this diagram, uh, we see that there's a treatment. We want to know the effect of the treatment on an outcome. There's some form of back door for the treatment that we're not going to be able to control for. We're going to call that the annoying thing right here. Uh, but there is some source of random variation uh, that is affecting our treatment and causing the treatment to be assigned or not assigned or assigned more or assigned less. Uh, and in doing so, we can isolate just that pathway from randomization to treatment to outcome. For this to work, there needs to be nothing else going on between randomization and outcome. Uh, there can't be any back doors between randomization and outcome. If there are, we need to be able to control and close for them so that we get back to what looks like this diagram. Additionally, randomization cannot cause anything else. If it does, then when we isolate just the part of the treatment that's determined by randomization, we're also going to be picking up a bit of that other treatment as well. So it's stronger than just saying there's no back doors. There also can't be any front doors from the instrument to the outcome except through the treatment. Now this sounds really, really tough, and indeed it is really, really tough. If you go to any sort of seminar where somebody's presenting a paper that uses instrumental variables, pretty much all the questions are gonna be about whether or not you actually believe the instrumental variable is valid or not. Can you actually believe that the instrumental variable that you've chosen is exogenous? It's a tough call, especially when we're talking about these social sciences or anything to do with people or complex systems. If everything is related to everything else, then how can it possibly be that you have one variable that just happens to be sitting out here minding its own business, completely unrelated to everything important? Seems unlikely. Now, if you go back a couple of decades, you can see people writing instrumental variables papers without really worrying about this much at all. You got people just sort of saying, hey, uh, here's a variable. I'm going to pretend that it's random uh, and then not really worrying too much about it. These days, people are a lot more skeptical. And there are, in fact, a number of examples of instrumental variables that people used to you think were okay to use and were exogenous, uh, but then people have sort of started to doubt that over time. A great example of that is rainfall. People used to use rainfall as an instrument for agricultural productivity all the time. Uh, you know, controlling for the part of the world that you're in, uh, you know, controlling for maybe the season that it is. Uh, it's kind of random whether it rains more or rains less in a given year. Right? And so that's going to make your farms more or less productive in a given year. And so you can look at the effect of agricultural productivity and all sorts of things, uh, war and conflict or economic growth or urbanization or whatever it is that you want to know the effect of agricultural productivity on, just use rainfall as an instrument if rainfall is actually exogenous, which it seems like it should be. Yeah, it should be kind of random whether it rains a little bit more one year or a little bit less one year than expected. However, a fair amount of research has looked into this and thought mm, maybe rainfall isn't actually all that exogenous. Uh, for example, rainfall is going to be correlated between people who live next to each other. If it's raining in your farm, it's probably also raining at the neighbor's farm. Uh, and so that's going to affect the outcomes that they're related to, which is going to affect other things, and then back to the outcome that you're looking at uh, in a way that's not just through your own productivity. So that could be a bit of a problem there, right? If we have a back door that goes through your neighbor's productivity because they're getting a similar kind of rainfall to what you're getting. Additionally, there's a paper by Heather Sarsons that looks at the effect of rainfall on agricultural productivity and finds that it is pretty much the same uh, in regions that have dams for water irrigation and ones that don't, which doesn't really make sense given how you might think rain would affect agricultural productivity. If you have a dam, then access to water is not really the main thing, and yet if rainfall still seems to really heavily predict agricultural productivity, it suggests that something else is going on that we might not be able to as confidently say is a source of exogenous variation. And that sort of thing is important, right? Thinking about whether an instrument is valid or not is inherently a theoretical question, right? Can you make the claim that the causal diagram does look like the one that we showed earlier, where there isn't a back door between the instrument and the outcome? Or if there is a back door, then it's something that we can measure and close. You need to be able to make the claim that that back door does not exist. And that additional front door through some other treatment also does not exist. 
So finding a valid instrument can indeed be very tricky. Uh, and ones that tend to be really well and people tend to really believe either have some form of actual explicit randomization behind them. Like I mentioned, you might do an actual experiment, but because not everybody does what you say, you use the assignment, the random assignment to treatment as an instrument for getting treatment. That's a very common and well accepted use. Uh, or other situations where you think you actually have real randomization. For example, there are a number of studies uh, that use random assignment to the, whether you get drafted into the military or not. That was a roughly random uh, pro process where the order in which you were drafted seemed to be randomly based on your birth date. Or at least if not random, then based on things that are not really relevant to the outcomes that we're looking at and therefore exogenous. There are also a lot of studies that use things like random assignment to different monitors, by which I mean like judges. Let's say that you are going in to get a trial for the crime that you may or may not have committed, and you get randomly assigned to a really harsh judge or a really lenient judge. That might affect the harshness of the sentence that you receive. And if your, your assignment to the judge is random, which it is in a lot of criminal justice systems, uh, then yeah, you have a random assignment to a harsh or lenient judge, and so we can see the effect of harshness using instrumental variables. All the things that I just described are examples of what are called canonical instrumental variables designs. Uh, instrumental variables that have been used in many, many different contexts, where you generally the same instrumental variable and treatment pair, like random assignment to judges and the leniency or harshness of the judge, uh, and get used over and over again, have been really heavily scrutinized. People tend to still think that they work, tend to believe that they are indeed exogenous, or at least we understand really well the ways in which they might not be, and maybe ways that we can correct for that lack of an exogeneity. There are a number of these kinds of canonical designs. I mentioned getting randomly assigned to a judge or some other sort of referee or monitor. I mentioned getting randomly assigned into the draft. Uh, there's also stuff like, you know, is there compulsory, how, how long is the compulsory schooling age uh, in your area? There's something called the Bartik Shift Share Design that looks at sort of how, com how big different industries are in different areas. And then when that industry gets a nationwide bump, it really affects one area more than another. Uh, there's things like the original wave of immigrants coming into a country, they live in one location and not another. And then the next wave of immigrants tends to go to that same location. Uh, there's stuff like whether you tend to get, having to give birth to twins. That might have to be an instrument for how many kids you have. You might have planned for two kids, but oops, you had twins. Now you got three kids. It's a random thing that determines how many children you have. Uh, natural disasters tend to strike one area, but not another. There's a hurricane that just narrowly passed your town. That's yeah, basically random for a determinant of you know, the treatment of getting your town wrecked by a hurricane. There's things like the direction of the wind that it's blowing on a certain day. Uh, there's things like genetics, Mendelian randomization, uh, where you have instruments of the kind, exact kinds of genes that you got based on the mix of your parents, and that's an instrument for having different kinds of genetic characteristics. Uh, there's lots of different things out there that are these sort of canonical designs that seem to have been scrutinized and come out well. And they all fall in a couple of different main categories, like either there's actual explicit randomization going on, like a random assignment to different judges, or random assignment to the draft order, things like that. Uh, or they tend to be things that seem like they should be completely random, or at least outside, completely undetermined by the systems in the model. It's kind of weird, in fact, that they happen to matter at all, and yet they seem to. These are things like the direction of the wind for pollution. Why would you expect the way that the wind is blowing on a given day to affect how polluted it is? Well, if you live in a city where the pollution tends to come from the east side of the city, and the, if the wind is blowing west, it's coming in, if the wind is blowing east, it's going out, that's pretty random. Now, why would the wind affect anything else uh, in particular? So to sum it up, we do need validity to hold for us to be able to use instrumental variables. We need to be able to say that, at least conditional on the controls that we have, our instrumental variable is a source of random assignment. And that way we are isolating a part of the treatment that is randomly assigned, and therefore we can easily see the effect of that treatment on the outcome. If that's not true, instrumental variables won't work. Not a whole lot that we can do about it. And finding a valid instrument is very tricky. There are a lot of instruments that people used to think were valid that we don't really think that much anymore. Uh, it can actually be really difficult to convince people if you have a new and cool instrumental variable uh, that it actually is uh, exogenous, uh, that it actually is a source of random variation. You're going to have to do a lot of theoretical, conceptual, contextual, and data work, which we'll talk about, uh, in order to convince people that your variable is indeed exogenous. Now, there have been a lot of different instrumental variable and treatment pairs that have been used a lot in the past that people tend to believe actually have some source of exogenous variation. And it might be worth exploring what some of these are, maybe go through the chapter listing of them, uh, to see some of the characteristics that tend to pop up over and over again, so that if you're looking for an instrumental variable for your treatment, you know sort of what to look for. All right, that's what we can think about in terms of the validity of our instrumental variables. Thank you. Thank you.